January 1st, 2023, the vessel Neatai began its journey. Laden with corn, it left Sao Paulo, Brazil, and embarked on a 35-day odyssey around the Cape of Good Hope, traversing the Indian Ocean, slipping through the Strait of Malacca, and onto the western edge of the Pacific before finally docking in Guangzhou, China, where it unloaded its cargo. Ships headed to China from anywhere, Europe, Australia, Africa, or the Americas all share a common endpoint, the Pacific which highlights a consistent theme in China's history. And except for one very brief moment, its economic and military strategies have been significantly limited by access to just one ocean. Because even with our incredible advancements in air and rail technology, 80% of our global trade still takes to the seas. Oceans are the real highways for our goods. As a powerful country that could be on a path to, let's call it unseating the US as the dominant global power, I'm on the fence and think it could go either way. To be a true superpower, you have to be able to dominate the ocean. But China's geography has posed unique challenges in China's long-standing efforts to expand its ocean access. Contrast this with the United States, a formidable power straddling two oceans. With extensive coastlines on both the Atlantic and Pacific, the US and other two ocean countries like Indonesia, Canada, and Chile hold a significant strategic advantage over the People's Republic. Access to two oceans is a major strategic advantage. It means more secure trade routes, a stronger position in global conflicts, and flexible options in maritime trade, especially in times of war. The ability to maneuver goods over open ocean routes can be the difference between who wins and loses. Most of China's freight moves on huge ships, carrying loads similar in size to entire freight trains. For a country that accounts for a staggering 15% of world exports, having access to the ocean isn't just a nice to have, it's essential. A large chunk of the raw materials needed to make those exports, like iron ore, have to be imported. Without ocean access, China's economic model fails, and it fails quickly. The United Kingdom is also a one ocean power, but despite having a similar amount of coastline as China, the UK's island status gives it a unique advantage. Half of its shoreline opens directly to the Atlantic and being encircled by water, it boasts the flexibility to navigate in nearly any direction away from its shores. In stark contrast, even China's maritime routes on the Pacific are constrained. Its path to the open ocean lies predominantly east and to some extent south, but these routes are fraught with geopolitical challenges, navigating near or through several less than friendly nations. Japan, with its long string of southern islands, including the major military bases on Okinawa. Taiwan, sitting 140 miles right offshore, also with major military bases. The Philippines and South Korea are all currently and have historically been unfriendly neighbors. Heading south from China's coast doesn't ease the problem. This route leads into the South China Sea, funneling into the narrow Malacca Strait, a critical choke point that links China to the Indian Ocean. This strait is so vital, yet problematic for China, that strategists have termed it the Malacca Dilemma. A staggering 80% of China's oil imports and a growing share of its natural gas must pass through this narrow, easily blocked corridor, closely flanked by Singapore and Malaysia, countries that have not always been on good terms with China. The challenges for China moving goods in and out of its borders are compounded by its internal geography. Much of its western border is dominated by mountains, including the formidable Himalayas, leaving only a narrow passage in the northwest. To the north lies a vast expanse of desert leading to the sparsely populated regions of Mongolia and eastern Russia. Compared to a country like Germany that also has access to just one ocean, but has well-worn overland trade routes with major trading partners leading all the way to the Middle East, China is an isolated country. Given all these geographical barriers, China relies heavily on these ocean trade routes, and importing food is top of mind. Since the 9th century, there have been 12 famines severe enough to be etched in history. Two of these famines kicked off the toppling of entire dynasties, and just 60 years ago, the worst famine in history claimed at least 30 million lives in China. That memory lingers. Every Chinese leader in power today knows how fragile the social fabric is when stomachs are empty. For every 100 calories consumed in China, 35 are imported. Corn, soybeans, edible oils, feed for livestock, pork, huge swaths of it, imported. Just in the United States, an area roughly the size of Utah is used to grow calories to export to China. Oil is another critical concern, almost on par with food. China consumes a massive 15 million barrels of oil daily, the most of any nation. But it can only pull 5 million of those barrels out of its own land, leaving a 10 million per day gap. To fill that gap, the People's Republic of China imports about 250 million barrels per month, mostly on very large crude carrying ships that come from the Middle East and pass through the Malacca Strait. This dependence on imports and in turn dependence on the ocean is why Japan imposed a complete naval blockade of China during World War II. Except for what could be smuggled into mainland China via British controlled Hong Kong and two tiny dirt roads, China was effectively cut off from world trade. 
Japan signed a treaty with the Soviet Union in 1941, ending the dirt road connection to the Soviet Union, and then they invaded Burma in 1942, ending the other dirt road that ran through the mountains of Burma. Even just the trickle of goods over these two meager roads made such a difference to fending off Japan that once the two overland routes were blocked, the Allies, United States and Great Britain, began flying planes that were not built to fly over the 8,000 meter peaks of the Himalayas, over the 8,000 meter peaks of the Himalayas to cargo lift what they could into Western China. China's leaders vividly remember these events, and since the end of the war have worked to ensure that their mainland never loses access to the ocean, slowly building up a world-class navy, and over the past 15 years, you've probably heard of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Under that policy, they've made great strides to ensure they have a say in ocean access by taking ownership and operational stakes in these 113 ports around the world. But only these two have the potential to solve the One Ocean or Malacca dilemma. These two ports, one in Myanmar and one in Pakistan, are the only ports of the 113 that have at least some overland access to mainland China. In 2013, the port in Myanmar gave China its first taste of the Indian Ocean. Natural gas began flowing directly from the Indian Ocean through the Shui gas pipeline on Made Island Terminal on Myanmar's west coast and into Kunming in mainland China. Just like that, China unlocked a new level. And three years later, they got their second critical connection to the Indian Ocean after the Gwadar port, developed by the China Overseas Ports Holding Company, completed construction. This port, featuring one of the most strategically important natural deepwater harbors in the world, significantly enhanced China's maritime capabilities and access to trade routes. This is the same natural harbor that strategists believe Russia was trying to get to when it invaded Afghanistan in 1979. Think about that, trying to get from Russia to this natural harbor, that's how good it is. Sitting on the southern edge of Pakistan, it's the only port in the world not connected to the Pacific that a container could now be picked off a ship, placed on a truck, and driven on a single highway into mainland China. In fact, the Karakoram Highway is the only highway that runs from the Indian Ocean into China, skirting the western edge of the Himalayas. 73 years after the last load of cargo flew over the Himalayas, China did it. They backdoored their way to a second ocean. With strategic toeholds on the Indian Ocean, they'll now look to increase the modest capabilities of each site. Currently, these are mere safety valves in China's trade network, not yet mainstays. Despite challenging terrain, ambitious plans for multi-lane highways and rail are in the works. Water leads the way, already equipped with a hospital and an airport. But the challenge for China in expanding or even just maintaining control over these ports is in the immediate areas and the host countries. So even though China has accomplished this huge feat of reaching a second ocean, it comes at the cost of being wed to these areas where conflict stems from entrenched religious, cultural, and ethnic differences. And unless something drastic occurs, the instability will be a continuous threat to China's investment and reputation in these regions. The leadership of China has now touched its second ocean. Will they be able to hold on to it? Thanks for watching. I'm Phil with Maxonomics, one of Morning Brew's new content brands. If you want to see more videos about topics like the one we covered today, subscribe to my channel through the link in the description. I'm going to be taking deep dives into must-know and little-known trends that are having a big impact on markets, business, and money.